our next speaker happens to be one of my favorite people, and I don't realize it's people, so that's a big deal. <laughs> Anil Dundriel received his PhD from Stony Brook University, which is also my alma mater, uh, and worked in the biotech industry for 10 years. He has been funded with numerous SBIR grants and has served as a reviewer of SBIR grants for the NSF. Currently, Dr. Daybell is the Executive Director of the Long Island High Technology Incubator here at Stony Brook. At Stony Brook. So, uh, I do have an overview presentation as well. And Colleen and I overlap quite a bit, so I'm going to pick and choose as I go through. But uh, at least time. So, if you have any questions, just raise your hand if you're on your call. And, uh, wave it if I uh, don't recognize uh, you're there. Okay. Who knows what an incubator is? Okay, how about who doesn't know what an incubator is? Okay, let me explain. Uh, Stony Brook does a lot of research, and from the research, there are patents, and there are startup companies that come. You just heard from one very successful one. And uh, so Stony Brook, a while ago, about 20 years ago, created a business incubator. An incubator in the sense of uh, uh, a mother hen and a nest and eggs, kind of, but for businesses, startup businesses. And uh, Stony Brook's incubators uh, incubate technology companies, biotech, IT, engineering companies, and in the near future, more alternative energy or clean energy companies. Uh, so the biggest one we have is the Long Island High Tech Incubator, which Jeff was, and uh, Mez described. But we have three others as well. One out in Calverton. Uh, there's space in the Seawood building. This is wireless information technology and the energy uh, center. There's space in there as well. Uh, so that's the advertisement. Um, out of Calverton, if you want to start a food business, make jams, uh, muffins, cheesecake. There will be a kitchen type incubator. So this is, uh, um, it's going to be called, or it's called the Consumer, the Agriculture Consumer Science Center. Basically a large kitchen, big ovens, mixing bowls, education programs, etc. So Monique, who runs that incubator, will be incuba incubating food type businesses. Okay, so that's the advertisement. Okay, last November, we were awarded an ICERTA grant as well. And this was to help uh, clean energy businesses. Uh, the uh, program's a four year program. Um, we help businesses in the region at our incubators. A lot of the things we do is spend time with client engagement. Uh, uh, pitches, business plans, etc. cetera. Um, we can help get incubator space. Uh, there's something called a boot camp where somebody, an entrepreneur that has a clean energy idea can go and get uh, two full days over a course of about a week, a boot camp on how to build a uh, PowerPoint as an investor's, investor's uh, pitch and uh, access to some of the technology facilities. So it's, uh, Jeff mentioned, Stony Brook has some facilities. BNL does as well. There's instruments and accelerators and all sorts of stuff that, as a small business owner, you may not be able to afford, but you may be able to get access and buy time on some of this, uh, these special facilities. So we can help with that. So our, we call this CBIP, Clean Energy Business Incubator Program. Interesting acronym, but it works for us. Uh, Stony Brook has a whole bunch of programs and centers. It would give you a headache trying to figure it out. We can help you navigate if you have a specific need. Okay, so what about me? Okay, as far as SBIRs, uh, my experience is in the biotech industry primarily. Um, I used to work for a company uh, called Oxygen Science. 
um, it's a few years ago, time goes by quickly. Um, the SBR program was really very useful for the business. Uh, Jeff had a lot of success. Our company did as well. We had a whole bunch of scientists who worked together. At one point, we created a grant group, and we applied for something like 100 SBIRs. When I left in 98, no, well, maybe it was 96, uh, we had 53 applications that had been funded. And I don't remember the dollar amount, but it, it's quite a lot of resources that came into the business. We primarily did drug discovery, and we used the SBAR process to validate new drug targets, therapeutic targets. So, for example, if you wanted to uh, develop an antifungal drug, um, I came up with a clever idea on how to target a particular molecular mechanism with fungi or yeast that could be used to develop new antifungal drugs. Same thing in a uh, uh, leukemia, uh, HIV, and then uh, I was looking at the way we're doing drug discovery and I thought, you know, we're focused on developing targets for disease, but how about developing a novel asset that could then be used for any type of disease? And uh, I applied to the NIH, and uh, the reviews came back. Three reviewers loved it, and one was, and that was my first lesson really about SBIRs. If you're gonna write an SBIR, make it as perfect as possible, because your goal is to get all of the reviewers to love it. If one is, and there's another grant there that all four reviewers love, you may not get funded. So, I also had experience as a reviewer at the National Science Foundation, and uh, my disclaimer is that every review group is different, every agency is different, but I think the lessons I can offer you from my experience as a reviewer will move over to the other agencies as well. And you have no experiences at all in reviewing. Am I correct about that? Anybody who's reviewed SPRS before? Okay, so let me des describe the processes I had uh, experience with. So over a few years, and it was pretty much the same each year, you have about 15 reviewers, and the program director gets 50 applications. So the goal is to give four reviewers to be primary reviewers on a bunch of them, maybe six or eight. And then every other reviewer can look at all of the grants as well. But your, your grants, you have to read very carefully and do a written analysis and submit electronically and then you go down and you meet, and you sit around a big table, and the goal then is to try to figure out, of the 40 or 50, which of the three or four best are there. And you don't want to spend an equal amount of time on each of the 50 grants. So, have you heard of the process called triage? It was originally, I think, used, uh, it's a French word, and on the battlefield. So if you're a medic, and there's a whole bunch of bodies lying in front of you, you don't want to spend an equal amount of time on everyone, because one person, he's got a cut finger, it's not gonna die if you don't treat him. Another person, no matter what you do, they're gonna die. So you don't treat them. This person, if you put some time on it, you might be able to save them. So triaging is grouping your people, or if you will, as a review, your applications, so you spend the most time on the grants that are going to be close to the border of funding. Okay. So when we triage, usually about half maybe 70% of them that you can talk about. Because 
the reviewers already sent back their written, uh, electronic applications and scores, and the program director say, okay, grant number 23, you wrote good, not great. Good, not great. I have issues with it. Not sure. Okay, you want to talk about it? No. You just give him two or three comments. Don't take the time to put all the comments. Give him two or three comments because if you give all 23 comments, it's a waste of your time. It'll, he'll never be able to address it. She'll never be able to address it. And so the review goes back. This is triage, unscored. Okay. So if you're a recipient of that review, and you get back a, a, a review that says exactly what I just said, and three or four comments, don't think that that's the only problem, okay? I'll tell you that we got a lot of grants that you literally could not read. I'd read the first paragraph over and over again, and I couldn't figure out what they're saying in English. Couldn't figure out what exactly they were trying to communicate. Or, I would get an application, and there were so many spelling and grammatical errors, I thought, do they think if they don't take the time to write the grant that we're going to give them the money? Because if they write the grant that way, what would they do with the money if we gave it to them? It's so badly organized, they'll never be able to spend it well. So we triaged a lot of those grants. And then, when the program director went around and said, grant number 32, you loved it, funded. Oh, I loved it, funded. I loved it, funded. Best thing I ever read. How much time do you want to spend on that one? Give him one comment, and tell him he's being funded, no discussion. It's going to get checked anyway. What's the purpose of giving him feedback? You know, or give him a lot of pats on the back? So we didn't spend time on those either. And then we took about eight or ten of the applications and went over them in detail. And some reviewers were swayed positive, others said, ah, you're right, that is an issue, and was swayed negative. And we arrange and rearrange, and then we give him the funding order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And he would decide how much money he had, and he'd fund up to whatever that is, that's the funding line. That's where the review takes place. At least it did then. I'm not sure how it takes place in other agencies, but uh, I'm betting it's probably similar to that. And at least that experience, if you think about it, is the way you should be writing your application. No grammatical errors. Okay? Okay, so I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm an old guy. I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, did some research with uh, some folks at Stony Brook a hematologist, uh, there's a statistician, and we did this research. At some point, it moved to the tech transfer office, and they applied for a patent, and they said, you know, we really should commercialize this. How should we do that? And they all looked at me, and I said, okay, I'll start a company, we'll apply for an SPIR. And we did. It didn't get funded the first time around. It did get funded the second time around. So, oh, it was a blood platelet diagnostic assay. Now, most of my experience is in biotech, but I'm going to guess that in this audience you're mostly engineer, IT, that type of thing. And uh, I think some of it will convey over, though. NIH, NSF has a lot of IT and some engineering as well. It depends on if you're building in a device, engineering device, that might be used on people, it could be through NSF or NIH. So. Okay, and so I described the uh, review process. Um, in the phase one, a phase one application has to have that innovation. And you know, Colleen described this pretty well, innovative, innovative. And innovative is not you know, uh, a blue color, okay? Now, maybe innovative in some ways, but think about innovation as being evolutionary, blue versus green, or revolutionary, where, you know, it's now incorporated into my uh, 
uh, watch or something like that. Revolutionary type innovation is what they're looking for, things that would really impact high risk, but big impact. Okay. Triage process, you'll get a written critique, but you know, depending on where you are, if you've got to score as close to the funding line, it's probably a good critique. They'll give you good feedback. When you submit a phase two, there's a business plan associated with that. Phase one is about building a prototype, proof of concept. Phase two is about the commercialization, and sometimes it's a second review. And on the second review, Depending upon the agency and the culture, there could be venture capitalists who are actually looking at the plan and giving it critiques. You really need, I work with a lot of technologists, you need a business person, somebody who can write a solid business case for your uh, phase two proposal. Every agency is different. It's, uh, it's all classified as SPR and STTR, but don't be fooled. Every agency has a different culture. So agriculture, USDA, you call down, and there's some great haired dude, he's the guy. He's the only program director. You talk to him, tell him what your idea is, and he said, you should submit a phase one application, and they limit it to, I think, $75,000. NIH, there's hundreds of program directors Finding the one that's going to get your application may not be so simple. Their limit for the phase one application now is 150000 for an SBIR. But what they say is that if you want to apply for more and you can justify it, then you can get granted more money. So a couple of years ago, the limit was 100000 the limit. The average funded application was 160,000. 80 or 90 percent of the applications asked for and got more than the limit. So that was a little odd, but that's the way NIH is. NSF, the rule was also 100,000. If you applied for 101,000, it was administratively rejected. So what's the point? Every agency has rules and interpretation of rules, and you have to learn what the details of, of it are. Some cases, like DOE, they'll issue a, a, a stated uh, interest, and if you deviate from that, it'll be programmatically or administratively rejected. NIH, the usual SBAR process, which is uh, every four months, they say, we'd like this, 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 and this, and then tell us what you'd like to do. Maybe we'll be interested in it. So there you can apply for something that is not specifically listed. Another agency difference. Okay, review criteria. Um, there are sample applications, and as Colleen warned, you know, it's, that was a few years ago, and there are also sample reviews. It was also a few years ago. But if you've never seen one, it's not a bad idea to look at them. So just the application has been shrunk now down from to half the page limit that was there before. So you have to look at the RFA or the RFP, uh, the current application instructions, and then look at the sample application to kind of get a sense. So how many of you have written scientific papers and published in uh, Journal of Applied Physics or Journal of Cell Biology? Anybody? Okay, if you can write a paper and get it accepted by a journal, you then have a good chance, I think, of writing a good grant. If, you ne if you've never done that, writing a grant, can you need a lot of detail and content, and you may want to partner. And Colleen recommended faculty at the university, highly recommended as well. Um, so, there are a few of us who can arrange a meeting, arrange a cup of coffee, or try to with a faculty member. But what I always tell people who come to me and ask about that is I say that 
I can arrange the cup of coffee, most likely, but I can't arrange the marriage. The fact that member has to be interested in you, and it has to be a, you know, mutual agreement. But that type of partnership can be a very strong one because they can write good grants if they're still faculty at a university or a research institute. They can write papers. So technically, they can do a really great job. They don't have the time. I mean, they teach. They write grants. They write papers. They serve on faculty committees. They have a family home, and on the side, they're going to start a business. Not likely. You could be the business partner for them. A few of them jump ship and go into business. And uh, people like Jeff are very special because he's got the technical background, he's got the business sense, but that's a very, very rare commodity. Partnership of a faculty technologist with a business person can be a good partnership, particularly if you want to tap SBIRs. Anybody have any questions yet? <laughs> yes? Just a more general question. Are all funded grants that a public record that they can be looked up on the website? Uh, I believe all the abstracts are. Abstracts are non confidential descriptions. Um, when you get an award, I believe there is a is a form that you have to sign that says, uh, or a box you have to check that says, if this is not funded, can we distribute the information in some fashion? Do you remember what that? Uh, yes, but the abstracts are always released usually six to nine months later. Okay. But they're all, they're all not proprietary. Okay, so the abstracts are always released and they should be non proprietary, they should be non confidential. If you're you know, when, you, when you're writing a grant application, you have to put technical details in there. And there are places, there's ways to mark those sections so that it says confidential, you know, asterisks on this paragraph, etc. If you don't give the reviewers enough detail to actually review it, it'll be hard for them to imagine why this is such a clever idea. But if you do, you also want to point out that this is a key thing that you don't want spread around. So reviewers do sign confidentiality agreements, but it doesn't stop them from thinking. You know, they go on thinking and they may come up with a better idea, etc. They just need to know that they're restricted in what they do. Um, but non-confidential abstracts are out there and it gives you some sense about what types of things have been funded. Um, okay, so innovation. Is it a paradigm shift? Are there completely novel concepts or approaches? Or is it more in a broad sense? What I was talking about, revolutionary versus evolutionary innovation. Is it a refinement or improvement? Um, I, the things that reviewers that I've seen love are the things that they read and they say, oh, wow, this is a great idea. And I look at the experiments they want to do these experiments will test to see whether this great idea will work or not. Give them money, let's see what happens. That's the best type of application you can make or technology you can be uh, presenting to this uh, um, grant application process. So environment. If you have a biotech idea and you say I'm going to do some cloning in my basement, not going to fly. But I have an incubator, and our incubator would allow you to do that kind of work inside uh, a wet lab that we have. And the university has licenses, you fall under their wing for all of that. On the engineering side, um, probably is less restrictive, but there's still some things you need to deal with. Uh, and you want to focus on your range if you're getting a grant like this. IT is a different story. You could do this in your basement. And, you can contract with uh, students to write the software for you, and it's a different type of uh, technology, different type of business. Um, the PI on the application has to have the background 
that's it's the, the uh, um, application. So if you're an engineer and you want to do a biotech project, um, if you're missing expertise, you can bring in consultants. So uh, if you have a business idea and it's the next generation photovoltaic panel, and your CV says, you know, I work in the financial industry, and there's no engineering degree, you may want to get somebody who's published in photovoltaic panels to be a consultant for your company. And you pay them on the grant. You get to convince them that they should give you a letter of support, sit with you, review the technology, and then you don't have to give away the IP, you don't have to give away the technology, but you hire them as a consultant, so the CV and their credibility supports the aims that you have. Electrical engineer, done research on this. Um, when you look at the technology and as it moves forward, you have to see what pieces are missing. So if you're starting a business, you know, you need a CEO, chief financial officer, um, CSO, marketing, etc. Maybe not in the beginning, but downstream you may. On a project, so I, I had a project that was a platelet diagnostic assay. I had a hematologist as a consultant, because that's the type of people that look at blood platelets. We had assays that we were developing, and, and I happen to have an assay background, which is great. But the data that comes out of the assay has to be statistically analyzed. So I needed a statistician. So we brought a statistician in. She was part of the research team anyway. Reviewers look at it and say, hematologist, got it, blood platelets. Business experience, assay experience, got it. Then Dolly got that. Statistician, credibility in doing the analysis, all the algorithms that are involved. And then on the business side, I said, you know, I've, I've developed, I worked in the biotech industry and I developed assays then as diagnostic. So that was a good check mark as well. Your technology, you have to decide when the reviewers look at it, what's missing from the management team or the grant team. Does this make sense? Okay. If you want to apply for a phase two, it's important that you actually have met the phase one goals. People ask me, I, I, I get a phase two, I do it. What do I need in order to apply? I mean, I've gotten a phase one, I do it, I accomplish the aims. What do I need for the phase two? Most important thing is accomplishing the aims. If you don't, you may want to think about whether you want to apply or not. Because if you don't accomplish the aims, that's kind of like the first phase. If you haven't shown proof of concept, why would you apply for development of the prototype that doesn't have proof of concept? So think about the phase two application and pass that when you write phase one. Because if you're over ambitious on the phase one and it's marginal whether you'll be able to accomplish the aims, whatever you say you're going to do, you need to do. So do what's required and focus on proof of concept if it's going to take two years, ask for two years. If it's going to take more money, ask for more money. But don't say you'll do a two-year project in one year, because you won't, you'll won't. you make it to phase one money, but you'll never get to phase two. You've got to accomplish the aims in phase one if you want to apply for the phase two and be successful with that. Yeah. Uh, there's a grant called Fast Track. So every agency has a slightly different program. Fast Track is essentially a combined phase one, phase two. So you've got a really sexy proposal. You have your business plan already written. You can combine the phase one and the phase two in one application. If you accomplish proof of concept, talk to the program director and say, I did it. A little bit more complicated than that. And then you roll right into phase two. So there's no break in funding. If you've never done a phase one, I discourage people from doing the fast tracks um, because it's a lot more. The threshold is much higher. You're asking for a lot more money. 
That said, uh, there are faculty who I know and companies that need to be better to apply for fast tracks and got them. Because <laughs> they know how to write grants, they had a solid business plan, and they got them. And the dollar amounts that you can get are, they're unbelievable. So there's a faculty member and a faculty member who has a company at Stony Brook that about a year ago got a $2.6 million uh, phase one award. Um, and this is from NIH. You can ask that kind of money, but you have to justify it. And there are some things that are, you know, you really need, you know, for proof of concept, maybe um, animal studies or some very expensive experiments. The reviewers read it, they get it, and they say, okay, in order to get proof of concept, you can't do it with a couple hundred thousand. You do need that kind of money. And if they like the goal and they like the project, and they'll, they can fund those. Okay, last thoughts. So these are the take home lessons. All the reviewers must love the proposal. If there's one cranky guy who didn't get it, you're not gonna get it. It doesn't matter whether they misunderstood or they didn't bother to read paragraph 13, line seven. If they didn't get it and they didn't like it, you're just not gonna get the funding. And I've sat in reviews where one, and I was one of the reviewers that read it thoroughly. I do my homework when I read these grants. And one of the reviewers was not happy about something. And you only have a certain amount of breath that you can offer in a, over a view table to try to sway them over. But if they stand their ground, it's over. So what I always tell people is, for the people, for the reviewers that are gonna spend 10 minutes at the Starbucks in Seattle, um, you need to give them a cartoon of figures so they get it. And then you have to give them depth someplace as well. But they should be able to understand what the concept is fairly quickly. And get them all to love it. Okay. The other reviewers could point to the figure and say, look, and maybe sway the reviewer. But to get them to look at paragraph 13, line 7 may, may be hard. They all have to love it. How do I get a phase 2 award? by completing the phase one aims. If the reviewer doesn't get it because the language is so complicated, because you don't have a cartoon that shows what it is, then it'll be hard to convince them that they love it, okay? Look at the cartoon, they look at the cartoon, they think a second and then they say, oh, this is a great idea, that's your goal. You have a certain number of pages, I think it's 12 pages now. If you're writing to the National Cancer Institute, you don't need to spend five pages telling them that there's a need for anti-cancer drugs. Focus on, imagine the reviewers know this. Who are the people you're writing to, okay? And focus on your technology specifically, the introduction to that, you know, the, the short path, the short introduction. If you can't write it clearly and mistake free, don't submit it. Wait till the next cycle. How many first impressions do you get? This is not a trick question. Anybody? Right, one. You reapply, it goes back to the same review panel, and they say, oh, they corrected the typos this time. Am I gonna have to fund them once where they make mistakes and fund them again when they do it the right way? One first impression, so make sure it's a good, clean application. Platform technologies, so direct write technology. One technology you can apply to uh, all different uh, commercial applications, different agencies as well. And my one NSF award, I sent it into NIH, one reviewer didn't like it. I said, you know what? This is assay technology, NSF. These people know technologies and they're gonna love it. Sent it in there. There were changes in the application, but they were not substantive ones. 
All four reviewers loved it, and I got the funding. Ultra-sensitive assay. Each agency has a different culture and rules, so you need to learn about their culture. I know NIH, I know NSF, I know somebody who knows about USDA, and we all know who knows about DOD and all the three-letter agencies. More information. What I found is that if you just type SPIR and the information you're looking for, Google's fantastic. It'll take you right to the sample review. They so type SPIR, NIH, sample, review, boom, there it is. Zinn's better, SPIR.gov is better, Google's fantastic. And that's all I got to say. Director of Department of Economic Development and Workforce Housing in 2005 to serve as a point person for companies in the emerging fields of energy, high tech, and biotechnology. She collaborates with local universities, laboratories, and business associations to design programming to support these industries. Prior to her work in Suffolk County, Ms. Broughton was the Director of Economic Development for the Town of Huntington where she worked extensively on the town's efforts to revitalize Huntington Station and advise, advise the town board on potential clean energy projects. Please stop. So, <clears throat> I counted the number of times that I heard uh, reference to phase three. And I, it was exactly two references, one from each of the uh, first two speakers. So for a really important federal program, this seems to just peter out. Phase one, you get started, you get revved up, you commercialize, you uh, get ready to commercialize. Phase two, lots of money, very important uh, products are produced. And then there is a reference to a phase three, but nobody really does anything about it. There's no money associated with it, there's no application. Some of the departments, I think it was mentioned, will take you to the next phase, which is when you become an actual company. But we don't want you to do that alone, and we also don't want you to leave this area. We have the resources that you've heard tonight at Stony Brook, tremendous resources, Brookhaven National Lab, Cold Spring Harbor Lab, if you're doing biotech, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of support for the first two phases. And so my part tonight is to let you know there is support for you after or as you continue. Um, my department is at the county level, but there are many programs at New York State level uh, that New York State actually has retooled many of the programs and they do have some uh, loan and grant products for new companies, for companies that are perhaps a flight risk. So I urge you to look up, um, I, all of these presentations will be on the website so you can just click on all of these links and see which programs might apply to the companies uh, that you are forming or have formed. Um, we work with not-for-profit banks there, we, we always encourage companies to develop a relationship with a commercial bank. You can get the SBA 7A loan through your commercial lender, but there are also programs to help you to get started through these nonprofits. And for some of your technology, you would be very good candidates for an angel uh, funding. And we do have our own Long Island Angel Network. We also have a Long Island Capital Alliance. So as you explore further how you can get your innovations funded through uh, the federal government, keep in mind that we have these other private funding mechanisms for you. Our program at the county level is value-added programming to help you as a company to grow. Our main emphasis is to help you to get the employees that you need to attain them to train them, and then to retain them. So we have a suite of programs. 
Uh, when I saw how many business plans, and let me just ask, how many actual companies are here in the room right now? Any actual businesses? So right now, as a company, you can avail yourself of these. So whether it's a, a receptionist that you need that we will save you the cost of a Newsday ad. Oh, I forgot the big videotape. We love our local paper. Okay, <laughs> we can, uh, if you're um, looking to locate, and I think we, we did meet with Jeff and some of the incubator companies um, we find don't really need our IDA. That's when you're ready to buy a building, to equip it with millions of dollars in manufacturing equipment. But we did start a new program called Boost, and I will update that flyer that we handed out to include that. And that is a program that will um, ease up on some of the typical IDA fees, which would be onerous for a new company or a small company, and also really um, is tailored for you to lease space. So it's meant for companies coming out of an incubator or a company coming out of somebody's garage with new innovations. So um, do look us up for that. And there is a program everywhere in Suffolk County and in fact anywhere on Long Island for you if you are looking to locate in a new building. So um, our community college has a specific program for high tech manufacturing. So if you're at the level where you're ready to make your product, these students are coming out with some very good um, manufacturing experience, but with the equipment that is, you know, AutoCAD and, and um, higher end, more, more specific to your technology industries. And then we also have a foreign trade zone. You do need to be doing a certain percentage of import-export to make that worth your while. But as you develop your companies and your technology, just keep that in mind as well. <clears throat> I run an Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club. Did anybody come because they got the notice from me? A couple, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so we cross-reference all kinds of programming for the Inventors and Entrepreneurs. And in fact, at next week's meeting, we happen to have a Stony Brook speaker coming from the Center for Wireless and Internet Technology. So we do like to keep the programming uh, directed toward the audience, but uh, we'll have patent attorneys two or three times a year, free legal advice, how can you say not like that. Uh, for women businesses, as you form your women's business operation, 51% of uh, female owner, we have a free resource in what we call SWEBEC. It's the county's Women's Business Enterprise Coalition. And what they do is help with procurement. Being a woman-owned business, generally the advantage to that is getting government contracts, and so we do have uh, some specific assistance to help you with that. And then, of course, if these things are really high-tech, I'm not sure that the county is uh, going to need it, but you never know because we run a jail that has security. We um, maybe up until Thursday have a nursing home that has medical needs. So we do have specific uh, operations that are at the county level. And what I encourage any entrepreneur that I speak to is that if you're here on Long Island and you're trying to sell to government, you just go to each government. So if you see Suffolk County that you can sell to us, you can also sell to Nassau County. You can sell to the towns and so on and to um, try to take advantage of that as a built-in market. And we really do look to buy from our own companies. That's something that, that the county executive feels very strongly about. And finally, there's a housing program. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details because we only have a couple of companies but basically, you have to have actual employees that you pay taxes on. And once you have employees, this program is here for you as an employer to help them to stay on Long Island. It was designed specifically for Long Island companies. It's very easy to use, but again, if we don't have a lot of employers in the room, I just urge you to use the flyer and, and go ahead and look it up on the internet. Uh, we have some interesting developments coming up that I'd like for you to know about. 
uh, we are building new buildings that are supposed to be tailored to energy companies and high-tech companies. It's out in West Hampton, which some of our uh, companies that are maybe in, in Farmingdale and Melville would see as too far afield, but quite frankly, this is gonna be new, beautiful space. It's gonna be very cost effective. And so if you're looking to locate somewhere and um, start up this company, coming out of one of the incubators, think about that. And then if you haven't heard, Canon is almost built. If, if you get uh, near exit 49 of the expressway, it's a pretty spectacular 800,000 plus uh, building and the synergies in Melville right now, if you are working on some sort of, I don't know, business machinery, software, even the restaurant industry is just revving up in Melville because they will be coming, I think, at the end of, of next year with about 1,200 employees and growing to 2,000 right there at that spot in Melville. So just something for you as entrepreneurs to keep in mind that there's going to be a lot of activity in uh, two places in Suffolk County. We also like to invest in our downtowns. We know that some of the young people, some of the graduate students that Jeff talked about working with, like to be in a place that's an actual place. So we invest in our downtowns and we would also urge you to do so. Um, and then uh, we also, we like to promote to our companies or to you as, as entrepreneurs that we have tremendous resources in cultural and film. We have TV shows and movies being made here all the time. And so we really like for you to uh, think about that aspect of, of why it's great to be here in Suffolk County and why you want to stay and grow your business here. And so I kept that short and not technical, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions.